one than another job? Or am I going to focus solely on this podcasting thing? Is this what, what I want to do? And, you know, I decided absolutely that's what I wanted to do. So I, I've been focusing on that full time. Since then, we've continued to grow our brand again. As Matt talked about, you know, over 20,000 downloads per month. Um, really close to about 25,000 at this point. And, uh, you know, more sponsors and, and really working on sales and bringing more at this point. Uh, I have written two, a couple more books because I had some time. So uh, I wrote two more books. The next one in the Bourbon Mixology series. This time I focused on craft distillers sharing their signature bourbon cocktail because many of them promote their businesses through cocktail recipes as we talked about before. Many do have bars on premise and things like that where they serve customers. And so they're making cocktails, so I thought that would be a good idea. And then I, I thought, well, if that works, I can also do one for craft breweries. So I wrote one called Mules and More because the, the, with the advent of the Moscow Mule, or actually coming back, it actually was a big cocktail in the 40s and 50s. It almost went away where nobody even heard of it but, you know, by this point. But now the Moscow Mule is a big drink, so I decided, you know, I would make one called Mules and More because beer cocktails suddenly became very popular. And a lot of the craft breweries, like the distilleries, create their own cocktail recipes with their product to kind of promote their brand and, you know, contact them and, you know, so I put together these two books. And I'm happy to say that the Mules and More looks like it's going to be the breakout star. So the, the, the one, the Bourbon Mixology Volume 4, maybe that's played out. It's not selling very well, a, a little bit. Uh, you know, if I would go back to 2013 when I started this, if I had those numbers that I'm getting now with, with that, that book, I'd be happy. But for right now, compared to some of my other books, it, you know, it, it's very small. But the Mules and More, that one I'll probably sell, you know, three or four books while we're just talking here today. So it's, it's kind of a cool thing. <laughs> Again, you do the work. The work was all done back in March and April of this year. But now you sit around, you go to lunch and you sell five copies, you, you know, you take a nap because you sell eight copies. So, uh, you know, that's why I just love writing books. So you, you continue to come up with ideas. And I've got ideas that I'll be working on for, for next year uh, to do that. Um, we're also kind of expanding the business. One of the things we did I think is very creative, something different than anybody else has ever done that I know of. Uh, and that is, we came up with this idea, we, again, we're the ABV Network. Uh, in terms of podcasting, we came up with the ABV Network podcast channel. So if you think about podcasts, again, very few raise their hands, but how a podcast works is if you like a podcast and you're interested in it and you want to get it every time they release a new episode, you hit subscribe. So you can do that with the Bourbon Show or the Bourbon Daily. If you hit subscribe on the Bourbon Daily, every day you're going to get the new episode. Um, same thing, the Bourbon Show comes out six times a month. Six times a month you'll get a download from us. They'll come to you and just hit, hit accept and it downloads. You can play it on your phone or whatever. Uh, what we decided to do with the ABB Network channel was what if we put multiple forms of programming on one channel. So if you hit subscribe, you get all of them. As opposed to just one show, it could be multiple shows. And the idea was, we looked at the Food Network. And the Food Network, you see how that is. It's not just cooking shows, and that's certainly part of it. But they also have reality shows, they have documentaries, they have original programming, they have you know, all different kinds of things. And we thought we could do the same thing with podcasts. We'll do a, a variety of podcasts. We'll have, and we'll do them in 10-week seasons. So, and I'm working on one right now called Bourbon History, where I have some of my friends that I've met in the bourbon industry over the years. They come up and they talk about one moment in time. It might be just focused on prohibition or uh, focused on one person. Uh, from the history of bourbon, there's this guy named Colonel Leeds Taylor. He's really the kind of the father, father of modern bourbon. And uh, we did an episode on him. So, so you, you, you know, you do these different uh, you know, episodes. But we also are going to do other techniques. We're going to do what I call podumentaries. We're going to do some, some documentary style things, but in a, a podcasting format. We're also going to release some of our best shows. We do, a, on the Bourbon Daily, we do a, a game show on that called Who Wants to Be a Bourbon Millionaire? Have you guys watched the TV show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire before? We do the same thing with bourbon. When, when you get a question right on who wants to be a millionaire, you get cash. On our show, if you get the question right, you get bourbon. So we, there's, just like on the show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, you get, you get cash on our show with each question you get right, you get another sample of bourbon. There's 15 questions on who wants to be a millionaire. We have 15. We, there's three t levels of help that you get. We have the same type of thing. And, uh, you, and you can lock in too. So if you get quite five questions right, no matter what happens, if you get question six wrong, you get five samples. If you get 10 questions right, you get 10 samples, no matter what happens. If you get 15 right, you get 15 samples of bourbon. Plus, we give you a bonus of 10 to give you 25 samples of bourbon from my personal collection. So. Uh, and it's all kinds of stuff. I, I mean, if you're really into bourbon, you know it's kind of all over the place. You can buy a bottle of bourbon for seven bucks all the way up to um, $5,000 if you're interested in spending that kind of cash. So, uh, 
and I've got a large collection. I, I probably at this time, Kat, what do you think? 300 bottles oh, all over the house. Yeah, probably 300. All, all over the house. So it's uh, all in the kitchen, on shelves, it's on the floor. It's, uh, I have a podcast studio in the basement. It's all over that. It's just everywhere. So um, a little bit, of, a little bit of everything. So, so yeah, we, we, we tap into that. The next thing too, in addition to the ABV Network Channel, which I think is going to be great. So again, we're going to release the, the like the Bourbon Million on there. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's going to be a central point where we can put a lot of content and people will get stuff from us it, it, long term every day. Right now, it's kind of slow because we're just getting started with it. Uh, the next thing after that is going to be YouTube. I think that YouTube should be a big thing for us. We've got some funny people on the staff. We're going to have them do some short videos. I'd also have an idea for kind of a, a thirty minute reality type style show. I don't want to get into that too much here because it's a good idea, but uh, it's not out there yet. But yeah, we're, we're going to do that type of thing. And uh, some of our shows we may record, we can watch them. You know, right now podcasting, you just listen. But uh, you know, there are more podcasts that are getting in where you can watch it as well. So you record it uh, with, with Bill. So we're going to, we're going to do that uh, type of thing uh, as well. So uh, I mean, we've got a lot of great things that we're working on in terms of the future. You know, I think in summary, why I've been successful is I've loved what I've done. You know, I found something that I love. I, I, you know, I didn't love what I've done my whole life. You can think I, I really didn't start on this journey until I was 45 years old. 2012, when my, my dad passed away, that's when I, I started all this. Before then, I was just a, a working guy who never knew what he wanted to do when he grew up. You know, you know I, I, I had this idea where I wanted to be a writer, but didn't really know how I was going to get there. And it was always, I'll, I'll do that soon. It's going to be soon. Soon I'll get started on that. I just never did it. I always had something else. Always was busy or you know had family responsibilities. But uh, with the passing of my father, I you know, found time to do that. And I'm you know, happy that I did. I also think too one of the keys was I didn't measure success in terms of finances. I had a job still when I started all of this. Uh, you know it's easy to say I didn't measure things you know, financially, but I didn't have to. I had a, a corporate job where I was making you know good money. And you know that, that wasn't the most important thing to me. So I wrote all those books. And you, you think about that list that I went through. I wrote book after book, and no one bought them. And I never got down. I never thought, man, this is terrible. I, I got to get out of this. I'm a failure or anything like that. Because I always thought, man, if I wanted to be a baseball player my whole life, and and I was given an option where I could get in one game and I ultimately struck out or never play at all, which would I rather do? And I'd rather get in there one time and strike out to say that I played in the majors, even if it was a failure like that. And I always felt like that with the books, too. Even if someone's not buying them, I'm doing what I like. I'm having fun. I, you know, and, and, and I know I'm writing good quality content. It's, it, that's really on you guys. That's on, that's on the audience. They're not buying what I've got here. But ultimately, if I keep doing this, somebody's going to find something that I'm doing, and they're going to like it. And that's what happened. You know, a weird thing, it, it, you know, I had started out spending so much money on uh, you know, promoting myself and advertising and Facebook ads and all these different things that I thought were going to help me be successful. And by the point where I finally found success with Bourbon Mixology Volume 2, by that, by that point I quit doing all that. I, I, you know, I, I just felt like I was throwing away money, so I stopped doing that. When I released Bourbon Mixology Volume 2, I just hit send and, and put it out there on Amazon and that was it. I didn't spend a dime on promoting it. Uh, you know, I did uh, you know some Twitter uh, you know, stuff with tweets, and uh, uh, I wasn't even really on Instagram yet when I when I officially started that. So that that was it. I, I didn't do anything. It found its own way itself, and that that's been one of the you know the side, exciting things about that. And of course, one of the keys was to going back to how I started this was being fiscal, fiscally responsible. So when I left my job again, I we always lived under our means. And I had the, the flexibility where I didn't have to go out and get a job the next day. Uh, you know, we had money in the bank, we had savings. Uh, I also got a severance from my from my the place that I worked at. And between those two things, I said, you know, I've got some wiggle room here. I can pursue this to see if I have the ability to turn this into a business. So I'm happy to say, you know, that that worked to my advantage too. So even when you get thrown a curve, even when you don't know what you're going to do when you graduate, uh, you know, just keep you know plugging away. And uh, you know, keep keep focused on, on what you're doing, and ultimately, I think you know you'll find a way. And as long as you find something that makes you happy, I think that is the key to your success in life. Any questions? Yes, sir. How much traveling do you do for your research and networking? Uh, I travel a lot to Kentucky. That's really about it, though. So 
Kentucky, in terms of you know bourbon, that's where it's at all the events. And I have to make myself available in the events and things like that. So many of the distilleries are located there. Uh, that's where I go back and forth to. So uh, you know, I, I've got uh, probably a, a, I'm done from here, but in January I probably got two trips to Kentucky, and probably one or two a month after that. Just you know, it, it makes sense if you want to be in the bourbon game, you got to be in Kentucky and be seen and. and Know that you're a part of what they're doing. I don't want to be like, well, here's the St. Louis guy trying to make it. I, I want to be part of the mix of what they're doing. Did you go to Hawaii to do your research on that? On your book on Hawaii? No, no, that was all. That was done. Did that? This is back when I had a corporate job. I did that every day. What I did when I was writing those small brand America books, I would set up those interviews during my lunch. So I'd drive to a park that was within two minutes from where I worked. I would go park my car and I would call people. You know, we'd set up. I'd set up the, the calls, but I'd always do it during my lunch. I'd call them during my lunch, interview people, let them come back, and uh, you know, write the stories later. So that's that's what I did. I, again, having a job, I just didn't have the ability to travel. You know, probably <coughs> wanted things like that. So yeah, yeah. Uh, what's your uh, biggest piece of advice for people who are about to graduate from college? Know that uh, again, I, you know, find. You know what you can do now, but you know always think that there's a, a, a bigger long-term plan than that. Unless you're something that's very focused uh, on what you want to do, and there's certain areas certainly that are. If you're a pharmacy student, like you know math or, or or a doctor, you're going to be a doctor. You know exactly what you're going to do. But if you're, if you're a guy like me, just a business student, you don't necessarily know what that means. So go out there, you know, find a way to know that uh, whatever you select doesn't have to be your final plan, and uh, always be thinking about what that final plan should be, even when you're in the job. Because sometimes you can get trapped a little bit, especially in these corporate jobs. And that's kind of where I was. I was trapped a little bit. Uh, because you're making a, a nice level of money. You know, I got six weeks off a year because I've worked there for 20 years. Uh, you know, you start factoring all those type of things in there. It's very comfortable. It was easy. It, you know, that, that, that job was easy. I, I didn't have to work in that job. Now, that, what I'm doing now, working for myself, I got to work. I, I, my days, 14 hour days, that, that could be the norm, but I love what I'm doing. I hated what I was doing when I was working in the corporate job. So, Always remember that there's something else out there. Be thinking about how you get there. Don't get stuck in a, you know, a bad job or ultimately you know, you're kind of selling your soul because you're paying some money. Yes? Are you like, an instant just one on um, like breweries for like beer? Are you really like, uh, when you get to a point in bourbon, like where there's really not as much to do anymore, will you venture out for like, you know, rum, beer, like more, like, no, no, I think that, uh, I do think that, you know, what, what the future could be. I think rum makes the most sense, uh, you know, as I, as I thought about that, because it has a very similar approach. Not the, not the rums that you necessarily find on the shelves at the grocery stores. I'm talking about if you're really into rum, they'll age it for, you can buy, find a rum that's been aged in a barrel for 50 years. That's pretty exciting to me. You know, the flavor profile. Uh, so, so, yeah, rum could be something that I, I get in down the road. Uh, a little bit. Right now, my focus has almost been solely on bourbon because that's literally what I know. At this point, my name is pretty well known out there too. I, I mean, so it, uh, again, it's helpful for, for what I'm doing right now. But it, there could be a, a point, and we do have uh, one show. Uh, we do have a beer show right now, so we do some other things. I'm not on that particular show. Uh, we've got a, a couple of gentlemen that do that for us, and you know, long term, we'd like to get into all forms of alcohol. Just find the right podcast hosts. So we'd like to have a, a wine show. And, Maybe a rum show, maybe you know, maybe uh, uh, scotch and things like that. So yeah, ultimately we'd like to get into touch on a little bit of everything in terms of the company. Now a lot of the writers out there have their own like writing process. What would you say your process is? What's your approach? My approach, well, um, my approach was for some reason. I guess maybe I had. This pent up creativity for so many years. Again, I didn't really start writing until I was 45 years old. Now, I did a lot of writing at work and things like that, and I always found that to be easy. And, you know, that's one of the things, too, going back to what you can do to help yourself. Recognize what your strengths are. You know, initially, I just figured everybody could write like, like I could. You know, I, I didn't think that it was, uh, you know, any sort of gift or anything like that I, because it was so easy for me. And, as a matter of fact, I thought, well, people just weren't doing it because they weren't applying themselves or they just didn't like it. But then I realized I, I, I'm a little bit different than other people, and then I can write nonstop. I, I, you know, if, if I the only thing that contains me from finishing a book is you know time, because I've, I I can literally write cover to cover 
not in one sitting if I had the time to do that. So, um, you know, for me, the process is just carve out the time to write and, and, and get there. Now, I am doing the next book that I'm working on. Again, I talked a little bit about Colonel E. H. Taylor, incredible guy. So, what he did for the industry uh, in the 1800s, when he was, was starting the late 1800s, he, he died in I think maybe 1920 or something like that. But uh, uh, when he really helped turn the bourbon industry around, was they were having all kinds of problems. Uh, it wasn't regulated or anything like that. You think of all the regulations today, that wasn't in place. Even the, the Food and Drug Administration wasn't up and running. So, so literally, that's where you hear about all these, you know, people claiming whiskey was medicine and all these type of things in the late 1800s. And also, one of the things that they were doing, bourbon is an aged product. So that gets to be a, a challenge, because if you make the product, you probably can't sell it for two or three or five or ten years, depending on, you know, what type of flavor profile that you're going for. Now, what people were doing, though, they were taking shortcuts. You know, the, the way that you can tell a bourbon's been aged is by the color of it. Well, what they would do is they put it in the barrel for maybe, you know, a month, and then they take it out and they put rusty nails in, in there, or they put tobacco juice. It gives it that color that looks like it's bourbon, but it's not. So my next book is going to be on Colonel H. Taylor, who worked with Congress to enact laws that ultimately regulated the bourbon industry. He made his life harder, but he also, because he was a legitimate maker of, of fine bourbon, he wanted the fact that, you know, to have some laws in place. So ultimately, he did that work with that. And, and what they did is when they made the Food and Drug Administration, they kind of copied off what they were doing in the world of bourbon. So, so he was really an important player. And he's kind of, he's still well known to people like me who are really into it. But for most people, they haven't heard of Colonel kind of Show. So I'm going to write a book on him. So that's going to be a little bit different process for me and then I have to do a lot of research. But I do have a lot of context because I've been doing this enough now. I know a lot of bourbon historians. I also have a, a lot of books that I can research on and, and, you know, and, and places to go. So, but it's going to be a good one. It'll be my first book like that. So the process is going to be a little bit different. Before, I've written a lot of nonfiction where I do interviews, write, interview, write, or just write about a topic that, that I'm interested in. I've got one book on my hand. So off the top of my head. Any other questions? Yep. For all your writers on your staff, how do they get happy? They don't. It's all, uh, we would make no income <laughs> off of uh, where we sell. So it opens up other opportunities for them because it's, it is a, uh, it's very well respected in the industry. So what, what happens is now, and, and we're seeing this stuff happen more and more, I'm getting a lot of people asking for reprints of articles, so it gets their name out there. And of course, we're all kinds of friends at this point. So, uh, and again, I don't make anything off of Bourbon's Up either. Now, I do off my podcast, I do off of um, my books, of course. But off the ZEP, I don't make anything. And again, it's just a promotional thing for us. It gives us legitimacy in the industry because when we're writing a review in there, we don't take any dollars or anything like that. So, so many times when you have a magazine that takes dollars, advertising dollars, when someone's reading a review, they think it might be skewed. Well, you know, did Jim Beam pay them some money for an ad and then you gave them a favorable review? So, we don't do any of that. So, the people that, that work for me or with me, if you want to say, um, they know that going in and they don't expect anything. They, they just like writing, it's a once a month gig, and it, they know that all the right people in the industry are looking at it too. So it opens up doors for them in terms of advertising stories. They get a lot of free samples and things like that. Uh, you know, they get contact. We have a beer writer who writes uh, about bourbon barrel aged beers. She hasn't had to buy a beer in a year and a half since she started with it because all the companies, they want their product for you because you know, she's got a, a great gig. Other questions? Hey, I really appreciate it. I hope, uh, you know, I don't know what uh, you guys expected uh, out of this, but uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, you found it interesting and, uh, you know, maybe listen to my podcast, especially when you're doing one. Thank you very much. Social media, we ask that our fans put uh, that hashtag in their profile. So it allows us to know who's fans of our stuff, just even when we see them. So I want to see those fans up here. If anybody wants them, feel free today. Thank you. Before you go, I think I speak for all of us when I say we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to do some talk first. Uh, we all signed a thank you card. Thank you. And then we also got you this. Uh, you might have seen what it was. It was something uh, I saw at the store. I thought that might oh, be nice. Oh, nice. Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, nice. cool. Very cool. Just a little thank you for that coming. Uh, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. That's awesome. Thank you. 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 Thank you.